Since 1979, I've been studying martial arts and kind of think I'm a badass. I've studied some Chinese martial arts. I've studied mostly Japanese martial arts. I've got a third degree black belt in a style called Ashihara. And it's a full contact, no pads martial art. We kick, we punch, we knee, we grab you, we throw you on the ground and stomp you. So I thought I was kind of really badass and <laughs> I was in good shape. And so I went to our friend Sarah's class and I went in there expecting just again to be supportive of her. And it literally hit my butt. I remember in some posture, I'm shaking. Literally, my legs are shaking, my arms are shaking, I'm dripping sweat. And I look over next to me and there's a lady next to me who's just smiling and perfectly still in her posture. And I'm like, this is the dumbest thing I have ever done. I'm never coming back to one of these classes. And it was all ego. So today's guest is a great one, David Truesdale. Dave is a registered yoga teacher and certified Warriors at Ease instructor. A few years ago, he and his wife decided to start a nonprofit in their state of Texas called Warrior Spirit Project. Its mission is to bolster purpose and strengthen the spirit of veterans and first responders through yoga, dogs, and dirt. And they offer a few tools for resilience, growth, and meaningful community engagement. And they do this by sharing their passion for the practice and providing trauma-informed yoga and eye rest meditation to veterans and first responders in the greater Dallas area. Prior to finding his path with yoga, Dave spent over 27 years with the Department of Navy as a special agent in the Naval Criminal Investigative Service, more commonly known as NCIS. He was deployed to Iraq as a counterintelligence team leader in 2004, and then later in Afghanistan from 2011 to 2012, where he helped support the U.S. Operations Command. He has received numerous awards and commendations from the U.S. Navy and Department of Defense for his efforts in serving our nation at home as well as overseas. Now, this is the longest interview I've ever done on this podcast. Even after editing, we still only barely got it below an hour. We actually talked for nearly two hours about his background, his experiences, and many of the great things he's witnessed in his yoga practice and path. And I highly recommend you listen to this conversation the next time you're in the car or when you've got a solid hour to offer him and his sharing. I really enjoyed this one. So Dave Truesdale, thanks for joining us and welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So we're going to get into the cool nonprofit you and your wife have set up to help veterans and first responders get into the practice of yoga. But before we get started, though, tell me about yourself and your background and career. So... I'm from a Marine Corps family. My father was a career Marine. Both my brothers were Marines. My grandfather was active duty Navy. So the military has been in my history forever. After I graduated college, I applied for a Marine Corps officer candidate school and didn't get accepted. But I went ahead and after that, I helped my father move when he retired from the Marine Corps and he introduced me to what was then known as NIS. So that was the Naval Investigative Service. And they're a federal law enforcement entity that works with the Navy and the Marine Corps. And so I picked up their literature and took it home, ended up going to work for the state of Texas for a couple of years. And then I applied to NIS and got hired and became a special agent with NIS. Years later, they changed their name to NCIS, which is a little more recognizable. Now they've had television shows and everything else. So that's been my career, and I did that for 27 years. I was primarily a street crimes agent, did special operations, guns, drugs. I did a lot of undercover work. I spent a year deep undercover with the FBI in an operation in 97. But because I kind of took a shining to that kind of stuff, every time I transferred, and I transferred nine duty stations in 27 years, the supervisors knew my reputation and they said, okay, we've got an issue 
and we need you to come in and start resolving this. And so I'm like, okay, because that kind of work is fun. And so that's what I did. And then in 2001, I went to Bahrain to do one of the last surveillance detection programs where we were basically looking for bad guys looking at the military installations. So we were conducting surveillance of people conducting surveillance. Interesting. Yeah, it, it, it really was. And, and so they thought at that time that was going to be the last six month program. Everything was going to wind down. And then, of course, after I got back, I went to Intel school and I was in intelligence school on 9-11 up in the D.C. area. So obviously, after 9-11 happened, I was stationed at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. They then asked me to stand up a counterterrorism team. So I stood up a counterterrorism team. We worked with immigration. We worked with, let's see, IRS, ATF, state and local, FBI. I mean, it was a just a huge operation. And so that kind of switched my whole career into the counterterrorism field. I then transferred overseas, ended up in a supervisory position. And in 2004, they started looking for volunteers to go to Iraq. Well, I'm the kind of guy that likes to raise my hand for the jobs that most people don't like to do. And for our agency, that was a relatively new thing because we are primarily civilians. We had some Marine special agents assigned to us. And initially, the thought process was when the U.S. goes to war, then the Marine special agents are the ones that go to the combat zones. But that's not quite the way the Secretary of Defense understood it. And so he said, nope, pack up your agents and let's go to war. And so I volunteered and I went to Baghdad. And I ran a joint military and civilian counterintelligence human intelligence team. So basically, I had military members assigned to me and I had civilian members assigned to me. And we ran all throughout Baghdad, up into Taji, down into Hilla, out to Abu Ghraib, just that whole general area, basically running informants and and collecting intelligence and then targeting people. So that was, I guess, my first taste of war. And that was in 2004? That was in 2004, yeah. Did you go, go back again overseas? Well, I did, yes. Actually, it was interesting because in 2005, they gave my team the DOD Counterintelligence Team Award. So that was pretty prestigious. And then... I volunteered to go back several times, didn't get selected. And then in 2011, I was going to retire in 2013. And so I went to one of my friends in headquarters and says, I need to go back again. This is what I do. And so he said, well, I've got a really choice position for you. And so basically, I was assigned to a special operations command task force. And so I went and did training with them and then deployed with a team, also very similar military and civilian. It was kind of a joint team. I had Air Force Major that worked for me. I had Army Chief Warrant Officer 5. I had a variety of other different military member ranks and services. And we deployed and provided specialized support to the Special Operations Command. So that was about five months. When did you finally retire from the NCIS? January 1st, 2013. So you've lived a pretty wild career, I think, in dealing with all kinds of guys in different situations, good guys and bad guys. So tell us, how did you get into yoga? Yoga is an interesting thing. My wife started teaching yoga as something that she could actually take every time we transferred as part of her career. 
So I had dabbled in yoga, practiced with her once or twice here and there, and and just like I said, dabbled. And then in 2004 or five, she had a student who went on to become a teacher. And she was at the same military base. So I decided that I'd go and take her class. I just wanted to support her. So I went to her class and I've been a martial artist my entire life. I mean, since 1979, I've been studying martial arts and kind of think I'm a badass, that kind of thing. I've studied a lot of different, I've studied some Chinese martial arts. I've studied mostly Japanese martial arts. I have my highest ranking in a style called Ashihara. And I've got a third degree black belt in Ashihara. And it's a full contact, no pads martial art. We kick, we punch, we knee, we grab you, we throw you on the ground and stomp on you. So it's a very vigorous. And so I thought I was kind of Billy Badass and <laughs> I was in good shape. And so I went to our friend Sarah's class and I went in there expecting just again to be supportive of her. And it literally kicked my butt. I remember, and this is years and years ago, in some posture, I am shaking. Literally, my legs are shaking, my arms are shaking, I'm dripping sweat. And I look over next to me and there's a lady next to me who's just smiling and perfectly still in her posture. And I'm like, this is the dumbest thing I have ever done. I'm never coming back to one of these classes. And it was, it was all ego. What other aspects of that class, besides the physicality of it, did you find kind of challenging and a struggle to deal with? Well, I think the physicality a portion of it was difficult to deal with, which I don't really understand because, again, I was in fighting form. I mean, I was teaching classes and and I was in good shape. But I never really understood the meditation portion. And so I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. And so I was just kind of sitting there trying to empty my mind. And now I know that that doesn't work. The yoga experience was also trying to just focus on being present at that time in that posture. Whereas in the martial arts, you're fast moving and, and, and you're thinking, okay, I can go from this point to this point. Whereas in the yoga, it's like, okay, I'm here right now and this is where I need to be. Yeah, I think the balance is one part of it that's a challenge, right? Totally different fibers in your muscles are getting worked in different ways. And that begins to tax the nervous system because they haven't built up the endurance to stay in that particular pose for a long time. And it is really exhausting. I remember being in Bikram classes 20 years ago when I first started getting into it, sweating like a beast on the mat, really shaken on, in certain poses. And it, it can be overwhelming and humbling. Yeah, very humbling. So this was 06, 07, or 05, around that area. Mm -hmm. And this is still seven or eight years before you retired. Yeah. Were you incorporating yoga from that point on a little bit along the way? Or did you put, put it on ice a little bit until you retired? I kind of put it on ice up until I retired. Again, I dabbled. If my wife was teaching a class and I didn't have anything to do at the time, and then I would go because she continuously kept teaching classes. But once I retired, I kind of knew from talking to other people, whether they're in the military or in law enforcement, that a lot of us die after retirement, just because we, we run so fast during our careers that suddenly when it stops, everything kind of shuts down. And so I decided I wasn't going to be one of those guys. So I kind of lined out a thing and I said, okay, well, I'll work out a couple hours a day. I'll practice my language skills a couple hours a day. I'll ride my motorcycle. Kind of lined out to make sure that I still had a full day because I was used to working 10, 12 hour days. Well, what I started doing was going with my wife to her yoga class. And after class, she would come home and I would 
go upstairs to the weight room in the location she was teaching, and I'd work out, and then I'd run home. And so, therefore, I'm, I'm hitting the lifting portion, I'm hitting the flexibility portion, the mindfulness portion, and then I'm getting in, you know, some good cardio. So I started doing that. And of course, ego gets in the way and lo and behold, injuries. I've had so many different injuries, shoulders and knees and multiple surgeries. So I ended up injured and had to have surgery and then could no longer lift. So I just really started focusing on yoga and went back to my surgeon for one of the follow-up checkups. And he's like, can you raise your arm? And because I had had a third shoulder surgery and I went, sure. And I picked it up and he goes, how'd you do that? And I go like this, (laughs) just being a smart aleck. And he's like, what are you doing? I said, yoga. And he's like, you need to keep doing that because you're way beyond where I expected you to be. And so I'm like, all right, so here's a doc. And, and he's a doc that had, he had done two surgeries on me. And I really respected him, liked him. He's a former martial artist too. And he said, keep doing it. And I'm like, I'm going to. Not only can yoga be a nice alternative to weightlifting and some more intense workouts, but it really can strengthen the hell out of joints. What's been your experience as far as how yoga helps with resilience and integration with the body? Well, so the thing that I really enjoy about yoga is if you do a yoga practice, And a lot of my yoga practices are very gentle now. Sometimes I do a strenuous power kind of yoga. And then other times I just do a a yoga practice that just makes me feel, I don't want to say, I guess, complete. I just feel good all over. And so sometimes if you go to the gym and you lift, and if you lift a specific body part, then that's all you feel after you do that. But after a great yoga class, I just feel good. Yeah. There's something about doing a little yoga. You hit all of the muscles, whether or not the teacher takes you through that around the horn, you can at least incorporate something within that class or after class on your own practice that literally helps you touch all the bases, back, shoulders, buys, tries, legs, core. I mean, all that stuff. Yes. And one of the things that I've learned through my training with organizations, my yoga training that we emphasize in our classes is because everybody's different, we all have physical limitations, maybe emotional limitations. And so even if the instructor is wanting you to do something that's not comfortable for you for whatever reason, maybe physically or emotionally, then we give the authority for you to just not do it. And this is how it becomes your practice. Instead of just following somebody, you really take yoga and make it yours. And that to us is so important. Yeah. And I think when people start doing yoga, they just want to follow the teacher and they kind of want to keep up and they want to do everything right. But if you have your own practice, you learn your own yoga, like you understand what you need. You can make those decisions during a class of either skipping a particular posture or grabbing a block, modifying it, backing off. And pretty soon, even though some classes do move a little faster than others, you you learn to make those decisions and anticipate when you need to make those decisions over time and really strengthen and working on the weak spots that are probably dogging you. Yeah. And that to me is because... If you go and just you take a class, you're taking a class that another instructor has set up, designed, and they may have perfectly good intention with their series of postures and how long you're going to be in them and everything else and the the breath work. 
But if that's not working for me, I go to the class for myself, not for the teacher, not so that the teacher can look out and go, everybody's doing exactly what I'm telling them to do. When I teach a class, if I look out and we're going through a particular posture and I look and I see somebody doing something that's similar and it's safe, but it's not exactly what I'm doing, I'm happy with that because I recognize that that person has recognized what they need. Yeah. And so I think it's important yoga can empower people for their own bodies. That you need to develop in order to be able to take advantage of creating the yoga that you need. Well, I think a lot of that could depend on the teacher giving you that authority. Because especially in group settings, people want to follow the leader. They, whether it's a yoga teacher, whether it's a professor, whether it's a commander, whether it's a whatever the position of authority is, when they say, this is what I want you to do, that's what you feel you should do. So it can come from two different ways. So either the instructor or teacher can say, you have my permission to do something other than what I'm telling you to do if this is not resonating with you. If this is not working, feel free to do something else. Or you just decide that, hey, I'm not always a rule follower and you may tell me to do something and I'm going to politely decline to do it. I think when you get the lay of the land and you kind of know what you're doing, pretty soon you have a sense of flow and a sense of orientation and a sense of what you need that ultimately transcends whatever the step-by-step instruction you're getting from the teacher. Clearly, like they're providing an offering for the whole class, but along the way, people start realizing, this is what I need. Yes. So Dave, let me ask you this. At what point did you decide to become a yoga teacher? Okay. So in 2015, my wife decided that she wanted to bring yoga to veterans. So she started setting up a nonprofit called Warrior Spirit Project. And as part of it, there was a group called Farmers Assisting Returning Military, or FARM. And they're local here to the Dallas area. And they were mostly individuals from one army unit who lost more service members to suicide after their deployments than they did in combat. And so they were trying to get their struggling troops to come stay with them on a residential farm. They would teach them farming and basically work on their mental health peer to peer so they didn't lose people to suicide. Well, Our neighbor was a master gardener and she knew about them. So she introduced us to them at a local kind of co-op farm weekend festival thing. And we talked to them and they seemed like really decent guys. And then my wife just said, you know what? I'm going to go out there and I'm going to see if they'll let us come and teach them yoga. She went out there and (laughs) interesting story. And I wasn't there at the time. and. She and one other lady, they went to the house, and it's a big, huge house in a residential farm area, and they walked in, and they're like, hello, hello, and one of these guys comes out, and he's in a, basically a walker, so they introduce themselves, and and my wife says, so I'm really looking at just trying to bring yoga to the military, and I believe that it can help. And this was uh, First Sergeant Orlando Garcia. And he looks at her and he goes, can you start on Tuesday? (laughs) And this was like on a Friday. She's like, sure. And he says, great, just come out. What time will you be here? I'll get everybody in the house. We're all gathered. We're all doing. And that's how our organization started. Wow. And it was... Every week, 
we went out there and and I thought, you know what? I can up my game and I can be a better example to these these individuals if I'm an actual teacher myself. So I went to yoga teacher training in 2006. It was called the Living Yoga Program out of Austin. Ellen Smith and Charles McInerney run that program. Both fantastic people. And it was really nice because they teach it at a at an ashram. And I'm a Christian. And to go to an ashram was kind of unique, but it was such a peaceful place and the people were so nice. And it was just a great place to study and practice yoga for 10 hours a day for 10 days. And when you walked away at that at the end of the first 10 days, you're like, this is this is magic. So tell me, when did you get exposed to Warriors at Ease? And what's something people should know about Warriors at Ease who are listening? Okay. So my wife had signed up and gone through the Warriors at Ease training before I did, because obviously she had been a teacher for for years. And at the time that I was going through my yoga teacher training, she was going through her Warriors at Ease training. But shortly after I got my RYT or my certification, we went to an iRest, which is Integrative Restoration Meditation Training. And iRest Meditation was developed for combat wounded at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. So it was actually taught in a facility, which is a big Warriors at Ease facility. So several of the teachers there were Warriors at Ease. And just the things that they did, the way they approached things, and, and this was just outside of Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And at the time, the meditation program, they actually had two trainers from the Marine Corps Special Operations Command in the class. One of the trainers was from the Naval Hospital at Camp Lejeune. So this was a very military-focused training for meditation. And that meditation, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but if you're not, you need to get. It is amazing. And Warriors at Ease is a big proponent of that. So in December 2018, I went to my first Warriors at Ease level one training, and everything resonated with me with regard to the way that they approach things and making sure you feel safe in your environment. If you go to a local yoga studio and they go, okay, well, here, we're going to do this, 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 and, and you do your practice, and then they go, okay, now lie down on the floor and we're going to move into Shavasana or our integration pose, however you want to refer to it. And I'd be like, "Mm, not so much. I'm not going to lay down on the floor and shut my eyes in a public space. Can't do it. And that comes from some of the experience that you were a part of overseas? Oh, yeah. Not feeling, not knowing what's surrounding you your body just doesn't feel safe. And so you're not going to be able to experience what you need for that posture, because that's a posture too, because your mind is racing. Okay, I got an open an eye. I hear a noise over here. I hear a noise over there. What's going on behind me? And Warriors at Ease really focuses on that that teacher is watching that space. And so to me, when I'm teaching, that's a very important thing for me. We are orient you to the space. If somebody walks in, make an announcement. So it could be in the middle of class. If somebody walks in, we'll go, hey, one of the regulars has walked in. Everything's fine. And that way, the, the people can continue practicing without that. I've got to look back over my shoulder and see what's going on behind me. Many of us civilians realize that the men and women who serve in the military, particularly overseas, but even domestically, 
are exposed to a lot of traumatic experiences. Warriors at Ease has done a lot of work with Department of Defense in exploring evidence-based techniques for dealing with trauma. Could you just speak to at a high level how yoga can help those first responders and veterans and warriors who have been exposed to those types of experiences and why sometimes there's that different approach in order to help make sure they have a safe space and can get the practice that they need? So I guess first by letting them know that they are in, and I hate the term safe space, but I mean, it's so appropriate. Letting people know that you are in a safe environment. And so you can actually take the time to experience, say, for instance, just feel what's supporting you. If you're sitting on the ground or if you're sitting in a chair, taking taking a moment to notice what's supporting you. Where are your feet touching the floor? the back of your thighs touching the chair, your back touching the back of the chair. And to take the time to notice these things, we very rarely slow down enough to notice these things. And I think that when you start to notice these things, you're better able to notice the different things that are going on in your body whether it's physically or whether it's emotionally, if you're sitting down and you recognize that, well, I need to use, and we don't call anything props. We call it gear because everybody knows gear. You know, if you're in the service, you've got rucks, you've got rifles, you've got all kinds of gear. And that's okay because that's good stuff. And so grab a block that's part of your gear and put it underneath your leg. And take some of that pain away. Don't push into the pain anymore. Because that's the one thing that so many of us have done for years is we push our bodies into performance that breaks down the body. I mean, war and law enforcement are for young people. And as we get older, our bodies break down. And so this is a way that we can use to kind of build back up again and get healthy. What's interesting, you have the autonomy and the awareness sort of to know that you are in control of your posture. You have choices. You can go grab some gear and support your back or your hip or your knee and gives you an opportunity to also embrace that feeling of being secure and in control. And a lot of the things that I've learned about what Warriors at Ease does and what works quite well for the first responder and military community is giving you those tools and techniques to really create the environment that you need to grab the rudder and be able to be in control how you feel, where you're at, and to sort of be able to sit with that in a way where you're comfortable and sort of, like I said, in control. Yes. Yes. And I think once you learn, because we've all conditioned ourselves to be uncomfortable and we've become comfortably uncomfortable. But I think that when we give you permission to be comfortably comfortable, that's different. And so if you show up at a class and we say, find an easy seated posture, And the instructor crosses their legs, puts both up, and they're very flexible. And you go like, yeah, I mean, I can do that. But no, find what's comfortable for you. And that's good. And so, again, it's giving permission back to you to be in control of your body. I think back to your own practice, gave yourself that level of comfort in your shoulder by helping knit and integrate that structural support and the proper alignment in those weak spots so they either are less weak or much stronger. It's like the Hemingway quote that many of us are broken, some of us are strongest in the broken places. Absolutely, and one of the things that I learned through the variety of injuries that I've had is there's a way to modify my practice to make it work. And so if my arms, if we're, for instance, just breathing and 
both arms out to the side, raising them up, and then maybe coming back down. Occasionally, the left one doesn't come back down right. And so I'll modify it and I'll come back down. And so when I teach a class, I'll mention things like that, that all of us have limitations, all of us have prior injuries, and that's okay. So find your own practice, because really that's what, to me, yoga is all about. It's not following an instructor's routine. It's you finding and you living your yoga and making yoga your own. I've got some of the power yoga teachers that I really like. I can do all their practices. And then other times, I just want to do a nice, gentle practice. Yeah, nice and easy. Nice and easy, just very restorative. Even if it's not a restorative yoga, it's restorative to my body. Yeah, and sometimes when you're just getting over a cold bug or you're just worn out from travel, and you're kind of tired. You don't want to go run to the gym or have a huge workout. You just need a little bit of a workout. So let's come back to the idea of integration. I know in your experience, yoga has been a big part of your life and not just integrate the experiences that you've been exposed to, but also live your life. How would you define integration? Well, it's kind of an interesting question. I think being able to use yoga as a part of my life where I know that if I'm feeling anxious, then I can come down to my yoga space. I can do my yoga practice. I can take the different postures that help me with maybe stress or anxiety and use those to bring me back to a state of equilibrium. And that, to me, that's the power of yoga. That's the real magic. And I don't know that there's anything else that I've done, whether it's martial arts or running or lifting, that ever brings me back to a steady state. For instance, I can go and take a yoga class and I primarily take yoga classes from people that teach who are warriors at ease trained, and they all have very similar teaching styles. And at the end of class, now I can be in a public space with my eyes shut. As, as a matter of fact, I do almost all of my yoga practice with my eyes shut. So I'll go to a yoga class. And at the very beginning, we start getting settled and I'll shut my eyes. And from there on, I just listen and I do the practice and I rarely open my eyes. But most of it, I just try to limit my senses and bring everything inside of me. Yeah, it's more or less a private class in your mind. Do you notice that? Not seeing where everyone else is and what they're doing also helps you to drop in more and where you're at? Oh, yeah. It really makes me feel that it's my practice. That's a really cool technique. A lot of people are dependent on paying attention to the teachers. I think a lot of these yoga classes need to slow down. I think, you know, before you've had a moment to even sit with the pose and kind of check in with where you're at, you're off to the next one. And I do understand some people love the cardiovascular workout of yoga, but they're really just jumping over a lot of the great stuff that people really should be exploring with. And in a slower alignment-based class, closing your eyes in certain postures could be a great way to mix it up for some people who are listening. Absolutely. And, and that's one of the things that I've always said, because I don't know how many times we've had people show up at our class and say, I took a hot yoga class and it was horrible and I didn't like it. And so I'm going to give it one more try. And I'm like, every yoga teacher is different. If the class that you go to, and this is especially for new people, if you go to a class and it just doesn't resonate with you, find another teacher. Find a different style. 
find one that resonates with you because there's so many different ways to do yoga. I love to get into low, deep postures and just hold them and just really feel them. And with my eyes shut, I feel alive. And that's the magic. And so when you can get in that place and actually feel the posture and feel the benefit of it, that's when you really start to recognize that, hey, there's something to this yoga stuff. My wife and I met a former Army Special Forces police officer. And so we met him. And I I don't even remember how he ended up contacting us. But we went and met him for coffee. And he was a wreck. I mean, he was at the end of his line. And we got him to start coming to our classes. And he has, over the years, come to our classes. For a while, he was regular. And you could see the improvement in him. And then he was hurt on the job and a very serious injury, couldn't do anything, had surgery, surgery didn't work, ended up having to go back and have surgery again. He would come to our class and sit in a chair just to be part of the community, to be able to sit there and breathe with us and to get the benefit of that, even though he couldn't do virtually anything physically. And he's regained his relationship with his family, with his children. I don't want to say it's a miracle, but I think it's a testament to what yoga can do and being part of a yogic community of warriors, because he's a true warrior. And he needed a warrior community that brought yoga to him. That's awesome. I think there's so much in there that I totally agree with. And at the baseline level, yoga kind of allows for rejuvenation. You're just one giant organism that's just constantly learning to self-repair and self-heal if you give it what it needs. There's something really fulfilling and gratifying about getting into yoga and having a practice. So no matter what comes up in life, you sort of are constantly bouncing back and returning to the practice, no matter what the setback is. Yes. And you mentioned the breath and the the breath is the key. I mean, obviously the breath is the first thing we take when we're born. It's the last thing we take when we pass. We were teaching at the VA hospital and the head of the mental health, who happened to be of Indian ancestry, and when we explained to her that we wanted to bring yoga and iris meditation to the VA, she's like, okay, she told her second, make this happen. And so we started teaching there. And I can think back to one particular student that he would come in and We would initially just start breathing. So we would do a kind of a short grounding yoga practice, and then we would move into a 35-minute eye rest practice. And once we started the practice, he was continuously yawning. And then he would keep apologizing to me. And I'm like, don't apologize. This is what we're trying to do. Because when you walked in here, you're all over the place. And now you're really starting to settle down to the point where your body is starting to just take breaths. And then from there, one of the other students, combat wounded, Vietnam veteran, Marine with complex PTS, he told me one day, well, first he'd ask if I hypnotize him when we do the iris meditation. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I don't, I promise. And he told me that iris meditation is the best thing he's done for his PTS since Vietnam. Wow. I mean, I don't know what better testimony can you get from that. Yeah. And also he's been carrying his struggles for decades. 
It's so fortunate people find these things within themselves to learn to take care of themselves. But it also, a lot of people struggle for so long carrying this stuff with them. It's just so great to hear that they finally connect with this stuff. Yeah. And that's the fascinating thing because here is a warrior who has been carrying this for that amount of time and suddenly decides, I'm going to try some yoga and meditation. Because a therapist says, hey, you should try this. And they trusted their therapist enough to try it. He was there every single class. And he would drive an hour to get to the class. We'd practice for an hour. And then he would drive home an hour and a half in rush hours. Wow. Yes. And again, so I think when we, when we start to look at it, we need to make those kinds of connections and we need to highlight those people as prime examples of how warriors, whether they're male or female, this is a real practice which is really beneficial. And so I think when you think about men and doing yoga and how Sometimes it's hard to get them to set foot in that door. But once you get them in there and they actually do the practice, I think they're hooked. So tell me, what's been your experience for why guys struggle getting into yoga? I think culturally, if you're standing in the checkout line at a grocery store and you look over and you see yoga journal. And I'm not picking on Yoga Journal. It could be any yoga magazine. They perpetuate a a stereotype. And so a lot of men will look and go, okay, that's not me on the cover. And so if I look over and I see somebody who's 98 pounds soaking wet and doesn't look like me, I'm going to look and go, oh, yeah, okay, that's their thing. And so I think that from a cultural standpoint, we've kind of pigeonholed what yoga is perceived as. And I think so that's the thing that we need to break through. And so all the different veterans organizations that I participate in or the law enforcement organizations is we were part of the Center for Brain Health, Brain Performance Institute, which is part of UT Dallas. They did a mindfulness program for the Dallas Police Department. And so we taught a portion of that class. So it was a it was a series of classes, and we would come in at the very end and we would teach a portion. And this was the interesting thing because a huge percentage of law enforcement come from the military. And so that was usually our first thing is like, okay, so who in here is actually a military veteran or still a reservist? And we were always pleasantly surprised at how many were. And then we would get them involved in a yoga and meditation class. So, I mean, I would look and just go, look, I'm a tough guy. I do yoga. I carried a gun for 27 years of my life every single day. And I do yoga. And so once you break through that stereotype, then I think you can punch those buttons. And if somebody looks and goes, I can go do yoga with this guy. Or if he's teaching, I can do it. Or if he's next to me practicing, I can do it. And so that, I think, is getting them to dip their toe in. Yeah, I think you're spot on. And I think it's one of the reasons why I I wanted to create this podcast, which was the best way to get guys into doing something they don't want to do is not telling them to do it because they won't do it if you just tell them. You got to show them and you got to show them with other men doing it or, or telling stories about why they do it and how they do it. And then they'll realize that there are other guys who are into this. What I really appreciate about what you're doing with Warrior Spirit and also what Warriors at Ease is doing and other folks out there with the military and first responder community, it's a very visible community. People see uniforms and people look up to that community. I think for guys, when they see that the military community is embracing yoga for health and wellness and getting through their stuff in life, 
It's a big statement that yoga is for everyone and more men should be leaning into yoga as a way to take care of their mind, body, and spirit than looking for a quick fix that we know over time is not a healthy choice and it creates more problems for not only those guys, but also the other men and women in their life. Yes, absolutely. And one of the things that we do is we focus on yoga and meditation as our primary program. But we recognize that there's all different other programs throughout the Dallas Metroplex that do a lot of different things. So we always try to help funnel people to different things. So if we recognize that, hey, this may not be for you, then here's another organization that does something different. And so I always go, not sure who your training's with, but look up Warriors at Ease. Get your people to get Warriors at Ease trained because you're going to find out that that is the best training that I think you can find. One, for the warrior community, and two, to really help you become a better yoga teacher to really allow your students to really experience what yoga is all about. Yeah, a hundred percent. And spot on with Warriors at Ease. I think one of the coolest things about their program is it's not just for yoga teachers. And they've talked about other types of therapists and occupational therapists, and other folks who work in physical or mental modalities, that their research and their technique and the skills that they've developed and are sharing with others fits in so many ways with helping everyone, not just people who have served, but anyone learn how to work with trauma in order to have better mind, body, health. So Dave, one last question here. So we know yoga is for everyone. How can yoga help America? I, I hate the word tribal because the two different wars that I participated in, were they're all tribal. And so I think in America, we're becoming very tribal. And when you become tribal, the potential for bad things to happen exists. And so I think that bringing people together who may not look like us, may not think like us, may not have the same beliefs as us, I think that that's a very positive thing. And I think that what happens is... When you do that and you actually engage and become part of a community, you may find out that the people that you're practicing with, actually, you have a lot more in common with. And when you have more in common with people, you're a lot less likely to dislike them. I mean, we all like to live in our little circles, military and first responders. We like living in our bubble because. The people in our bubble have the same experiences as us. And if I start talking with somebody about something that happened to me in a combat zone, sometimes people will look at you and go, I mean, I'm sure inside they're thinking you're a monster. And yet I'm not. So I would prefer to be with people that go, oh, yeah, no, I know exactly what you're talking about. That's because we have shared experience but that limits us. And a prime example is in one of the yoga programs that we went to throughout the years, had a teacher come in and she was a very woo-woo yoga teacher. And she came in and she started saying some things and I could just feel my key was rising. I mean, I was to the point where I wanted to get up and walk out of her practice and I didn't. And later on, I decided, you know what, this is not healthy for me. I need to talk to her. And so I went and they had a lunch in between. And I went and I said, hey, can I sit down and chat with you? And she's like, sure. So we sat down and we started talking and come to find out that she had volunteered at the VA hospital for years working with warriors. And so here, because this snippet in time 
in a lecture that she was giving so touched a part of me that distressed me to the point I'm just thankful that I guess I had the the courage and the humility to go and say, we need to talk. Yeah. And ever since then, I mean, we're still in communications. And it was just like, I mean, I could literally feel the heat rising from my body. I was just getting so upset. Yeah, I think that's a great story. I think it's a perfect example that like everyone right now, and I totally agree, we've got different tribes. We've got everyone sort of going to their corner. You got people in the middle who are thinking like, we're going to get squeezed here by one way or another. And I think everyone is having a shared traumatic experience right now with reality a little bit. People are so reactive now. They feel threatened. They feel disrespected. They feel ignored. And we're getting into a place where everyone is taking a lot of things very personally. Rather than looking at it as us and them, we should be thinking more we. We have such an amazing country that has so much potential and talent. And it really comes down to the mind. And it has the ability to realize that you have a choice to decide on how you want to react to things. And you also have a choice on whether or not what you see or hear lives in your narrative or not. I have a lot of respect for the courage and the humility and the vulnerability that you had in going up to that woman and being able to share what you're going through. And so you created that shared experience that you and her, from your perception or her perception, probably felt like didn't exist. And then it existed. (laughs) It's like everyone's dealing with this shared trauma. And one of the things that I think is just great for yoga for everyone is learn to check out and check in. People have to learn to push back from what they see and hear out there and start getting to know their neighbors and other communities and other tribes because there's more that we share than we don't. And it comes apart quickly when people start to get in panic mode because that trauma is just driving everyone bananas. Yes. And I think you said something when you talk about reacting. And I think that that's something that we can learn through our yoga practice is responding vice reacting. So when you react, it's usually an immediate reaction to something. But as we become more studied in our practice, we can stop, take a moment, and then respond with right action. And that, I think, is important because our initial thing is to punch somebody in the face. And yet that's probably the worst thing that we should do. And so you stop and respond with right action, whatever that right action is. When you've cultivated your yoga practice and know what you need, that right action can be grabbing your gear, the block or the bolster, and supporting you in your pose or choosing not to do a certain pose or doing a different way and just creating that space in your mind to make a choice that's the right choice. I think it's cultivating that ability to be aware of your mind and not reacting, but responding with a place of agency. Yes, I think that's an excellent way to look at it. Well, Dave, this has been a great conversation. It's been really great talking to you. I want to thank you for your service to this country and also thank you for sharing your practice and your story. I can just tell that you have a real passion for this stuff. I know you really believe it and feel it. I really appreciate you spending this time today. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And it's always great to talk yoga with other guys. That's right. That's right. So hopefully we can just continue to spread the word. Absolutely. I'd love to keep in touch. Well, thanks again. Be well and have a great 22. Thank you. You too. So for those of you who stuck through the whole conversation with Dave, you know, we really get into some great stuff at the end. And it was a bit of a tough project trying to figure out which part to cut to make it a shorter conversation for this podcast. But, you know, I'm glad we got as much as we did in because it was all gold, particularly this quote where he says, find your own yoga practice because really that's what it's about. It's not following an instructor's routine. It's you finding and you living your yoga and making yoga your own. To learn more information about what Dave is doing at Warrior Spirit Project, 
check them out at warriorspiritproject.org. And also remember to subscribe to this podcast and tune in for our next guest, Dominic Stanley. Dominic found yoga after returning from deployment in Iraq. And you know, like a lot of veterans, he had challenges and struggles in returning to civilian life. And yoga really wasn't on his radar until his wife saw a Groupon ad for a hot yoga place and suggested he try it. 